Hi everyone, welcome to the Firefly Software Future of Recruitment Crowdcast. I'm your host Cameron McLennan and today I'm fortunate enough to be joined by Alex Moyle. Alex, before we kick off, can you uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself please? So my name is Alex Moyle. I've worked in the uh, sort of recruitment industry for just short of 20 years now. Uh, I spent 16 of those in a large corporate, both as a temp recruiter, perm recruiter, manager, director, and then headed up the learning and development function for many years. And nowadays I run my own training business, but also I'm the founder of a productivity tool for recruiters called Nurture. Excellent, Alex. Thanks very much. So Alex and I have known each other for, for a number of years now uh, and always really, really enjoy chatting to him. I wanted to get him on today to chat about recruitment metrics. Um, I speak to recruiters every single day of various levels and seniority, and um, some people have a view of metrics that um, is, isn't such a nice one. And in some instances, that can be as a result of, uh, dare I say it, perhaps maybe mismanagement and, and not using numbers and metrics the way that they could. So, um, Alex, why are metrics so important in recruitment? Well, I mean, I think. Metrics are so important for a, for a recruitment business or any business or any any sales professional is because really they're the indicators with which help you make better decisions. Uh, I think the challenge with with KPIs is often they're seen as a black and white, right and wrong. Where actually they're an indicator. That's what the name name says. They they highlight uh, an area where you could be doing well or you could be doing bad. And, and just like any high performance athlete, they all have metrics uh, that they measure themselves against. And so when chosen correctly, it really helps a business understand what's going on and helps them to be able to not only predict performance, but maybe spot problems that will affect performance before they actually do. Cool, cool. So, I mean, as a recruiter, um, how do you decide what metrics are important and, and which ones aren't? Well, I mean, I think part part of it comes down to for the for the if we think of it from a business perspective, it's about the business really thinking about what metrics do they believe make the most difference in the sales pipeline. So, for a lot of businesses, they might think call time or number of phone calls is the most important metric. So that's where they put all their energy and effort. Uh, and others maybe think it might be interviews. So, in terms of what is a right or wrong metric, it's really about you determining what is right in your sales process and what do you see as the best the best indicator and like, how would you go about identifying i guess how would you go about identifying that in your sales process well i mean i think part of it is is firstly do you have your sales process mapped out okay. uh, and what i find when i travel to lots of recruitment companies i say well tell me how your process works and they can maybe map out their recruitment process, but they're not able to always align the metrics that they measure people with against the process that they've got written out. Okay. Uh, and so ultimately metrics are really about bringing people in at the top of the funnel and how do you manage energy and effort to make sure as much of that as possible comes out as billings at the end. Uh, sure. And so that that's what you've got to do is if you don't have your process written out and sort of inverted commas your way, then, then it's very difficult to choose metrics that are meaningful. Yeah, okay. And like, if you've got your funnel and you've got your stages mapped out, what's the best way, do you think, to identify problem areas in the funnel? Well, I mean, you've got, like, there's sort of two parts to your, so two parts to your, uh, two parts to your, your metrics. So firstly, you've got the actual volume metrics uh, that you have in your business, and then you've got the effectiveness metrics. Uh, and a lot of times the numbers aren't about what's right and wrong when you first do them. It's about understanding how they change and what is driving those changes. So for some businesses, uh, six interviews will equal a placement. In other businesses, 12 interviews will equal a placement. Both are equally good metrics. The key is an organization understanding how that number moves. Over yeah. Time. Okay, cool. Brilliant. And, um, what, what are your views on uh, on traditional KPIs? So uh, so um, I live in Bristol. There's a, a band, a city near us called Newport, and there's a band from Newport called Goldie Look and Chain. Yeah. Uh, they, they had this song, which is uh, Guns Don't Kill People, Rappers Do. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a believer that, that, that KPIs don't kill motivation. Bad managers do. Uh, but, and... It, so the, part of the problem with, with KPIs is that they become the lead 
for the conversation and the end of the conversation rather mm -hmm. than a guide for where that conversation needs to take place. So, and what that means is, is that some businesses don't train their managers in a way to be able to use KPIs to, to, to direct conversations. So for instance, someone uh, isn't getting many interviews on their jobs and it might be that they're not sending enough CVs out. So what they'll say is send more CVs, send more CVs. Mm -hmm. What they won't do is like, is it a volume issue or is it an effective issue? And so if the issue is between sending CVs and getting interviews, then you inspect the yeah. quality of the CVs that are being sent, the quality of the matches that are taking place. And what you then do is it, because it's guiding you to a particular part of the process that isn't working. Uh, and that's where sort of very blunt KPIs are things like number of calls. Yeah. Uh, and the number of people I know that are still measured by number of calls and call time, but don't have any meaningful output metric to determine the success of them. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a, it's just a way to basically set fire to your employee's motivation. Uh, oh, if all you're doing is saying, have you been on the phone for three hours every day? Yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it doesn't have a place, but I'm saying <laughs> it needs to, it needs to have a follow up output that, that then, then becomes more important than the number of calls that you make. Yeah, I actually worked in a worked in a, a sales office uh, years ago, whereby even if you'd uh, even if you'd smashed your smashed your target, um, you would actually get commission docked from you had you not hit your call volume. So even if you're performing and you're hitting your number, you get a dock. So ended up with them um, a sales team that were um, calling the talking clock to get their number rather than actually maybe seeing what they could achieve from making other potential good calls. Um, just baffling. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I was first made a manager, as a manager, I was paid on volume of activity, not effectiveness or, or profitability. Mm -hmm. and, and what it does is it, I can understand why businesses do it, because actually it makes it really easy for a manager. Have you hit the number? Yeah. Uh, what it doesn't do is breed sophisticated managers that can manage different types of people and yeah. actually help people move things through a sales process. What they breed is autonomy yeah. that that basically hit the number, but don't yeah. understand actually what the number's meant to be achieving. And the whole point of metrics is that if I don't know what I'm doing, if I do those things, I should hit my target. And over time, the standard metrics get converted into my personal metrics that are relevant for me based on my capabilities and achievement. And the art of a, a business is to sell the standard KPIs as a, as a template to guide your future, your future performance. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I think the the mismanagement aspect of it is very much sort of bred in industry where ninety nine percent of recruiters in the marketplace just hate KPIs. So how how would you go about like motivating a team that that hates metrics? I get I get asked this this a lot, uh, and. And my answer is always is always the same. You've got to think, well, what do the individuals want to achieve? You know, and often managers are pushing metrics and KPIs, but they're not connecting it to what those individuals actually want from turning up to work every day. So if you want to make anyone do anything, the easiest way is to show them what they're going to get out of it. And so when you sit down with someone and you go, here's the KPIs, right, tell me again what you want to earn this year. Right. What do you want to achieve this year? Right. What are you going to spend that money on? OK, great. OK. And what do you want? What else do you want? And then you go, right, well, let's talk about what you need to do that and what metrics you need to achieve based on your current level of performance to achieve that. Uh, and what you what? So, for instance, every professional athlete has more metrics than you can possibly imagine. Uh, but yet you don't see them on match of the day or you don't see them at the Olympics going, oh, I'm really micromanaged by my manager. I'm really micromanaged. All I am is metrics. I'm just numbers. Uh, yeah. they talk about it and they're proud of their numbers. And the reason they're, they're proud of their numbers is because they own those numbers. They're them. They're, they are the things that they've got to achieve for them to hit their goals. So if a manager doesn't make conscious effort to connect what's being asked with actually uh what needs to be done uh and what that person's got as, as a goal then then they're always going to be flogging a dead horse or dragging the horse uh as it were interesting 
Guys, if anyone has got any questions that they want to put to Alex, just go ahead and drop them in the in the sidebar. I'd also be interested to see if anyone, uh, everyone's opinions on uh, KPIs and past experiences as well, because we also discuss that and sort of build that in a part of the part of the conversation. Um, are there any metrics that you think recruiters often neglect, um, but should be tracking? Uh, I think, I think that there's there's some traditional metrics which. I think recruiters don't 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 always always look at so and one of those is is fill rate so what percentage of the jobs that you work do you actually fill uh and if we were a lawyer we wouldn't lift a finger until we were being paid but the reality is is that our business the best recruiters are the most efficient at converting effort into fees mm -hmm. and fill ratio is one of the easiest ways of going you know what how many jobs do i work and how many do i convert into money and once you know that number and you're true with that number, because what level says, oh, I fill 80 percent of jobs. But actually what you don't what they don't include is all the ones that after a couple of days they decided not to count. Uh, but, but if you look at your fill ratio, it starts to help you manage your time and input. So if you know you fill one in four and you want to make that better, the only way you're going to make that better is either by having more jobs that gives you a better choice so you can choose to work better opportunities or you work at getting more influence and control on the on the vacancies that you've got, and it and and then there's lots of metrics and ratios that that come from that. Uh, but that's probably one of the ones that I think most recruiters dismiss as irrelevant, but actually is probably the most important one for determining how much effort converts into uh, into money. Yeah, uh, I think the key the key is is that it's about picking a metric that's meaningful to you, uh, and. It's and someone just spoke about the one size one size fits all, uh, but it's but it's picking it's picking the numbers. So I like I like fill ratio. I often like uh, number of interviews per vacancy. I think yeah. that's because a lot of people drive CVs to jobs, CVs to vacancies. But actually, CV to vacancy you can control because you can just send loads of shit people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, interviews, interviews to job was always my favorite metric because it really basically says this is how much influence and control you've got over, over those opportunities yeah. and so if you're getting one interview per job you're you're basically a sniper uh but if you're getting three or four the numbers are starting to to, to help you out some of the newer metrics that i i see people see people using is 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 sort of really focusing on the number of new qualified prospects that they engage on a, on a weekly and monthly basis. Now, in the old days, that might have been a subset of phone calls. Yeah. Uh, but nowadays, as you're look, as more and more recruiters are looking to market to prospects based through social media, through email, it's, it's thinking about what's the number of qualified prospects. And when I talk about qualified prospects, it's someone that buys what you're selling, uh, is likely to buy in the near, in the near to midterm future, and is able to buy from you. Uh, and it, and it, so it's not just about the number of people I spoke to or the number of emails I generated. It's about how many people have I engaged with that I actually believe I want to nurture over over time. I like that, yeah. I mean, from, um, from our side of it, we're always trying to start, um, we're, we sort of measure something similar to that from the point of view of um, online conversations with people that are in the market, in our target space, um, qualified to buy, and then trying to take those offline conversations offline at some stage, and um, try and have a, we have a, a three sort of three touch point metric. So the first one is you know uh, drop a like on something that's relevant. Second point is um, add some value to one of the discussions, and then the third point is add some more value and see if they're open to move the discussion offline. Yeah, try and, to track and, on that. yeah, and 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 that's an, that's a I mean you guys have got a very marketing centric approach to business development where. Most recruiters approach to business development is very sales orientated, which is, are you looking for a job or do you have a vacancy? That's the, that's the pitch. The thought yeah. of initiating a relationship that maybe you have to nurture over a period of time before they give you any sort of commitment or likelihood to use is, is strange to a lot of recruiters. Uh, yeah. And when I started, it wasn't because you had to probably speak to someone seven or eight times or email them seven or eight times before you'd get that meeting and then you had to keep in touch. But the, the, the industry has become so vacancy centric, uh, the art of marketing and nurturing relationships in, in a lot of instances has been lost and not many metrics actually support that. It's all about number of calls, how many jobs do you get? Yeah. Uh, and some, some people count leads 
Uh, I know a few agencies do that, which is, but that's still basically, are they ready to buy now rather than what am I doing to nurture relationships? Uh, rather than the very top of the funnel. Um, so Billy's saying there, what about the number of prospects that are, uh, that are not being contacted, looking at your addressable market and then how you engage them and nurture them? Yeah, so, so, so there's a, I mean, those, those sort of link to, in recruitment language, uh, are things like contact cycles. So one of the biggest missed opportunities for recruiters, and Billy will, will love this, is that a lot of recruiters put all this energy and effort into effectively manufacturing a product, a candidate, that if they don't fit that square at that point in time, they throw them out the window, even though that product could be useful in the future. And yeah. so one of the metrics that I always... And I still talk to people about, but sort of seems no one's really interested in, which is what percentage of the candidates that you've worked with over the last 90 days are you still in active contact with? And when I mean active contact, it could be a phone call, it could be an email, but you're measuring it on their interaction as in a, a two-way conversation rather than just, I sent an email. Yeah. Uh, and, and because a lot of recruiters don't really forget that active candidates and contact with active candidates is actually business development calling. It's not boring calling, like yeah. your candidates are in the market. They are in the arena playing the yeah. game. And what you want to do is be in the game playing. So the quickest way to get in the game is to speak to people that are in the game. Yeah. And the so contact cycles to, to Billy's point is really important. And I've, I mean, I worked for Robert Half for many years and I've sat in hundreds of reviews where Every month you'll sit there and you'll go, what percentage of the candidates that you've worked with in the last six months are in contact cycle? What percentage of the people you've met in the last 90 days are you in contact with? You know, and yeah. that's about, and that's just about making sure that you are going to get, you get a return from the time you've already invested. Yeah, it makes sense. And most of the market, well, a lot of the markets are all candidate driven now, so you'd have to focus on the, on the other side of it. When If you get a good candidate 99% of the time, you're probably able to find a, the question, the question I always ask specialist recruiters, because they go, oh, I am a specialist and I work in a niche market and I've got this unique talent pool. And I go, oh, just out of interest. So uh, if you took everyone that you've worked, every candidate you've worked with in the last six months, what percentage have you had a two-way conversation with in the last 60 days? Yeah. Uh, and, and they can't answer because it's just not part of their... It's just not part of their remit to nurture relationships when people aren't looking for jobs today. And, and part of that comes from... A lot of recruiters, they might be working in each market, but they're working such wide geographical areas where actually one week they're in Aberystwyth, the next week they're in Truro, the next week they're in Aberdeen, the next week they're in Lincoln. And they just there's no incentive when you're driven by what am I going to close this month to keep in touch with those individuals. And that's where the merging of marketing and marketing automation is supporting a lot of recruiters where actually marketing can support some of that heavy lifting and contact through... Yeah nurturing of, of contact pools and I know you guys do quite a lot of that and you can create contact lists and create contact cycles of lists and and support the the sending of newsletters and and value conversations uh what is the what's the uh, the wackiest metric anyone's ever told you when you've been delivering training or anything they've ever sort of been uh, monitoring in their business no I, I've, I've seen more I mean that probably Wacky, I'm just trying to think. I, I'm, I'm not feeling particularly wacky today. I'm, I, I <laughs> tend to dismiss the ones that are, are, are relevant. Nonsense. Most people, they're in the, we're in recruitment. It's a pretty simple beast, right? So it's not that difficult. I think the, the, the wackiest ones, I, I, I probably still go back to call volume and call time. And it's not that they don't have a, a place, but, but really it's about how quickly can you get people to be more connected with the output and effectiveness metrics so you don't have to focus on that. Because core metrics are boring for managers and they're boring for the people that get managed by them. Yeah. Uh, and that's why, that's why a lot of people leave like the recruitment, like the recruitment battery farms. So yeah. like they just bring in people, drill them, like your pages, halves, S3s, like but they just, they just breed recruiters. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why people leave after a year, 18 months, because those businesses just can't let go of every metric where more sophisticated businesses are able to sort of say, well, you know what? You're doing 10K a month. We won't talk about calls anymore. Go down to five and I'll start talking about it again. Uh, 
And it's about using metrics that are relevant for individuals. And as people become more self-sufficient and they evidence that based on performance, yeah. they earn the right to get more uh, independence. Yeah. Uh, because we're all motivated by, I mean, we're motivated by three things. If you, if you listen to Dan Pink, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So autonomy is like, I want to be left alone. Mastery, I want to continue to improve. And purpose is I want to achieve something. And so all metrics need to connect with that. So a metric is motivational if someone can knows how they earn their way out of being measured by it. Uh, and so when they, when they achieve a certain level of performance, you go, congratulations, I don't talk about it anymore. Uh, and then when they're not performing, you go, here it is. Yeah, that's really good. That would, uh, yeah. And that's a more sophisticated way of, for a manager to manage metrics. It's just, they're there to drive performance and help people manage performance. But sometimes people don't need them all the time. Yeah, yeah. And um, if you've tuned into this and you're going to start to use metrics to either build on your own performance or grow your business, what one thing would you say you should start doing tomorrow? So first thing I'd do is map your process and then create metrics at each stage of the process. So one of the one of the games I always play with leadership teams when I when I run training sessions is I say, right, list all your metrics on the board. And I say, now I'm a biller, new biller, and I want to build 10K a month. Tell me how those metrics will help me do that. And I'd probably say 10% of managers can explain explicitly how those metrics, volume and effectiveness, can lead to me hitting 10K a month. So the first thing I would do is map my process and then go, well, what do the milestones look like? So for, if I give you a snapshot, so if I want to build 10K a month, my average fee is... 5k so i need to make two placements my fill ratio is 25 percent. so i need eight jobs uh how do i get eight jobs well i probably convert 20 percent of my leads so i now need 40 leads uh where do i get 40 leads from well and and then you get to well i need to probably contact this many candidates i probably need this many clients in my funnel but but because it's all articulated, volume and ratio, someone can sit there and go, oh, I get that. And then they go, that's an awful lot. And then you go, well, how could we improve that? And then they could go, well, I could improve this ratio here. Then the numbers come down. And I have this spreadsheet that I give, which... And so suddenly, actually, it can all seem quite achievable. So you only need to do a lot at the top if you're shit yeah. at what you do in the middle. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you improve your fill rate, the top goes down. If you improve your lead conversion rate, the top goes down. If you improve your lead generation rate, the top goes down. Uh, but if you're bad at working jobs, you're bad at converting leads, and you're bad at generating leads, you're going to have to do a lot of activity, which means you're probably going to have to do 125 calls a week. Uh, but if you're sensible, like keep in touch with your candidates and keep in touch with clients that you think will use you, yeah. track leads effectively, then you can generally uh, not have to do a huge amount to be successful. Brilliant. Really, Alex, that's really, really good information, really good insights. Um, I guess, does anyone have any questions for Alex? I had a, I had a list pre-made pre here, and we've, we've actually managed to rattle through them quite quickly. Um, what's this from Mark? Come in, they don't have a place. Do you think KPIs for some companies is like, like metrics? It's like a drug habit. Are they ever going to kick it? Um, well, I mean, I, 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 challenge, I challenge Mark. Mark. Mark says they don't have a place. They do have a place. Uh, and they have a place for newer consultants that need to learn the craft of the job. You, mm -hmm. you talk to a professional golfer and say, would you be as good as you are if you didn't go to the driving range and hit balls six hours a day? Uh, the difference is when they hit six hours a day, they're thinking about every shot they hit. Well, when I go to the driving range, I try and hit 50 balls in six minutes and think I've yeah. been to the driving range, and, and I think I've practiced. And so the, the volume early days is important. You know, uh, firstly, because you're not very good at talking to people, so you need to get better. Because you're not very good at talking to people, not many people are going to want to talk to you again. So you need to talk to a lot uh, or email a lot. But as you get better, volume and core metrics become less important because your effectiveness and the volume of things that you've got on the go actually, uh, actually go. So I think the better question would be, uh, when are they going to get better at letting go when someone's proved they can do the job. Uh, and, and the story I'll, I'll tell you, Cameron, is I, I go and meet a lot of startups and I meet loads of them that come out of S3, Michael Page, yeah. uh, Robert Half, and they go, oh, 
we're going to treat everybody like adults now. We're not going to have any metrics. We're going to have no KPIs. We're just going to treat everyone like grown-ups. I go, oh, okay, good luck. Yeah, enjoy that. Uh, and then I go, and I come back three months later, and I go, how is it going? I know how it's going. And they go, oh, it's dreadful. Like, they're not working hard enough. They're not picking up the phone. We've had to do metrics. And I go, oh, why is that? And he goes, well, it worked for me. And I go, well, the reason it worked for you is that when you first start, being drilled by metrics teaches you the job. Yeah. And, it, and it internalizes what makes you good. And so it's about, and really, because all metrics are is like, if you do these things, you should get good. Uh -huh. You know, and so what you do is you use that to teach someone the job. And when they prove they can do the job, you let go of it a bit. And so it's the, the I have like an inverse triangle when I do leadership stuff. And so this is performance. Yeah. And this is direction. So when someone's got low performance, you're high directive. And as performance improves, your direction goes down. And you just let go of metrics along the way. You know, and, and, and what, what that means is, is that, and so what I do is I work with companies and we actually map how they're managed from a metric perspective changes dependent upon their level of performance. So the managers can go, you're at 8K, this is what I'm going to ask you about this month. Uh, you're at 4K, this is what I'm going to ask you about this month. And because it's really visible, because what happens is, is that the rookie's sitting there going, oh, look at Cameron. He's not on the phone. He's not getting a hard time about metrics, but actually Cameron's doing 16K a month. And, and has earned the way out of that. But because it's yeah. so hidden, uh, they don't get it. So when you write it out, everyone goes, right, I get it now. If I can do this, this is how I manage. It's um, really, really interesting that, Alex. I mean, like even with a look back at my own career and I've, I've in a couple of jobs where, where they implemented that, I mean, it would be a totally different, and not only not only would the, the performance of the teams improve, but the workplace in general would have been a much, much sort of, much, much happier place, I think. The challenge is it's quite a sophisticated way of managing. It requires you to be able to have difficult conversations. It requires you to be able to adapt what you do by pers by individuals. Uh, and it's still not black and white. There's still people that think they should be in the other box. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes it's just easier to say, just all get on the phone. <laughs> yeah, I think I think adapting, adapting per person is really important. I mean, no two people are the, are the same. Um, Saw something on, on the uh, football other night, and they were interviewing uh, Stephen Gerrard talking about um, man management skills. And he sees managing under 18 squad just now, and he was saying how he has to actually manage every single person completely as individuals. He can't do anything on a group group mentality because they're all they're all different. Yet they play together as a team. I find it really interesting. Well, one of the one of the most effective sessions I had with a manager was I was about. A year in, I was on about 10 temps, and my, I went to this class, this training course, which was all about metrics, and it was understanding your own ratios. So I had a temp desk, and the drivers for a temp desk are number of workers, number of hours the workers work, pay rate, margin, assignment length. And over a day, we worked out how I could double the size of my business just by tweaking individuals of the metrics, and we called it the power of one. So if you place one more temp, they all work one more hour. They all lasted one more week. We had one more, pay them all a pound more and one more percent margin. What difference would it make? And we were all trained how to calculate that, yeah. whereby you could, you could learn the levers you were twisting. So I came back from that day and I, all my temps were working an average 30 hours. So I rang them all and went, you're not working full time, work harder. And the average went up to 33 and I just got a 10% increase in my business. <laughs> You know, and, so then, and because I knew the metric and because I understood what it did for me every week, I then looked at all my timesheets and anyone that worked under 33 hours got a call and went, are you OK? Have you been sick uh, or are you just looking for a permanent job? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I know they're going to leave. So it's about managing those details. But when when you can train your consultants to understand their own metrics, they can begin to self-manage. Yeah. And when they self-manage, they then come to you with. I want to move this metric or I want to achieve this. Or I want to achieve that. And this is how I'm going to do it. And then the manager's job is just to enable them to do that. Yeah. Uh, and so my manager for a number of years used to come up on my monthly reviews and go, Alex, this is the metric you gave me four weeks ago. I'm just letting you know right now, you're not going to hit it. What do you want me to do? Oh, I'm really sorry. Yeah, I should do that. I need to work harder. But all she was doing was just showing the mirror up to what I'd written. And, and that's, and that's just as that, that's much more motivational. Uh, yeah. And so the advice I often give is when people do monthly reviews is I ask, 
the managers who does the preparation for the meeting. So does the recruiter do the preparation and then deliver their plan for the next month, or is the manager doing the preparation? And and, and whoever owns it is typically the one that, that that enjoys it the most. And so if you give the ownership to the recruiter, they're much more likely to come in with their plan. And what managers will find themselves doing is actually toning down those expectations. Like, whoa, whoa, Cameron, like let's mm-hmm. say, let's just go to step one this month. I know I know you're gonna to want to build 20k, but what yeah. other how can we and the manager's pulling them back, but going, I'm going to help you. Yes. Because individually, we're much more uh, ambitious than our managers are. It's just managers never let us be ambitious because they're telling us what we're going to do already. Yeah, really, really good. Brilliant. There's loads of value there, Alex. I think for anyone that's watching this, if you're an agency owner or a recruiter itself, like what, what you can take away from this and start to do inside your business. Alex, if, if anyone that's watching this just now or in the future are watching the recording back and they want to get in touch with you and have a chat with you about this stuff, what's the best way for them to, to reach out to you? So you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, but if you want more content like this, and I do these sort of web, I have my own web show. Uh, yeah. Uh, where we cover topics like GDPR and marketing, you can go to nurtureit.io and look at our blog. Yeah. Uh, that's where we, we take a similar approach to you, Cameron, which is our product speaks for itself, but actually we just want to give loads of value to the recruitment community. Yeah. And so uh, feel free to go there, sign up, and uh, just just engage. You know, you can reach out anytime. Uh, all the members of Nurture It, they get 365 access to me, and I spend a lot of time within the tool, within our chat feature, helping people with recruitment problems, not just... How to, how to use the tool. So, uh, but yeah, we just reach out just like yourself, Cameron. Let's log in to another show. So, great. Alex, thank you so much for your time. I've dropped the uh, link to Nurture It in the comments on the right hand side, and uh, Christine's dropped in a link to uh, Alex's uh, LinkedIn profile as well if anyone wants to get in touch. Um, that's it from us. Just a wee reminder to uh, let you guys know that the uh, next show has been booked in. Uh, we will be uh, on the next show hosted by, um, joined by Ryan McCabe from the CEO of uh, Audro. Um, so I'll drop that in the comments as well. Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. Thoroughly appreciate it. And uh, thanks to everyone that, that tuned in. Um, we'll hopefully see you all on the next show. Cheers. Thanks a lot for having me, Cameron. That's been fantastic to be part of the show. No worries. One last thing from you guys, you'll notice there's a call to action down the bottom there called the recruitment metrics you need to care about as an agency owner. If you guys want to click in that and give that a download as well, you'll see so there's some more information in there. There's Alex. Look at him. He's printed it off already. What a legend. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks very much. Fantastic. See you all later. Take care, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.